This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagarde that is broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Tijuana, Mexico. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event is Ambulatory Bariatric Surgery, Balancing Quality with Safety. And we'll feature experts from Montreal, Canada, and Washington, California, New York, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas in the United States. We would like to thank our partners, Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, and Facebook, based in California, Laparoscopic Surge, based in Tunisia, and Bariatric News, based in the United Kingdom, for setting up and promoting this regular scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, Medtronic, Easy Surge Medical, Lexington Medical, Fulbright Medical, Reach Surgical, David Medical, MindRay, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Blue Sail Surgical, Fit For Me, Arthrex, Stryker, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquid Band Fix 8, Bariatric Solutions. Our silver sponsors, WL Gore, USGI Medical. Our bronze sponsors, Intuitive Surgical, Boringer Laboratories, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This is the 72nd webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that has over 3 million unique downloads and is streaming live to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, IBC Instagram, IBC Twitter feed, and LinkedIn. This event is organized by Professor Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC, and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Imperial College London and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Santiago Jorgen from the United States and will be moderated by Professor Michel Gagné from Canada, Professor Robin Blackstone and Professor Phil Schauer, both from the United States. My chair today is Professor Santiago Jorgen from the United States. He is Professor of Chief in Minimally Invasive Surgery and Vice Chair of Business Development, University of California, San Diego Health, United States. He's also Director of the Metabolic and Bariatric Institute and Director for the Center for the Future of Surgery, Department of Surgery, University of California, San Diego. He's also director for the Center of Future of Surgery, International Institute of Metabolic Medicine here in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. I will now pass it on to my great friend, Professor Horgan, to introduce our moderators. And Professor Horgan will be joining us in a couple of minutes, but let me start off by presenting our moderators today. We have an exceptional list of global experts. Let me stop by uh, presenting Professor Robin Blackstone from the United States. She is CEO of Blackstone Health, a company focused on translating clinical rel relevance to healthcare value for patients through innovation. Also global head of preclinical, clinical, and medical affairs for Ethicon. First woman to serve as the president of ASMBS 2011-2012. As ASMBS president and in partnership with the American College of Surgeons, established the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Accreditation and Quality Improvement Program. Ira, a Fulton Chair in Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in 2018 at the University of Arizona and served as the North American President of IFSO on the Board of Governors of ACS and multiple commi committees of SAGES. Also founding board member of the Obesity Action Coalition and the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Roundtable on Obesity. Professor Blackstone, welcome. I also want to uh, pre present Professor Michel Gagné from Canada. He is senior consultant hospital, Sac de Cour, Montreal, Canada, chief of surgery, Westmount Square Surgical Center, Montreal, Canada, and formerly professor of surgery, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Whale Medical College of Cornell University, and Mount Sinai Hospital in Miami and Florida International University, all in the United States. Welcome, Professor Michel Gagné. Also want to uh, welcome Professor Phil Schauer, great friend and founder of co-founder of IBC, Professor of Metabolic Surgery and Director of Bariatric and Metabolic Institute at Pennington Biomedical Research Institute of Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and formerly Professor of Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, in the United States, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, also in the United States. Past President of ASMBS and Principal Investigator for the infamous Stampede Trial. I will now pass it on to Professor Robin Blackstone to present our first speaker. Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to everybody who's here. This is gonna be a very exciting session today and a very hot topic. As many people are discussing um, whether bariatric surgery can be done safely 
in an ambulatory surgery center. And today we will have some answers for you. Um, I get to introduce the first speaker who is Dr. Paul Wisman. Um, he's the medical director of the MBSAQIP accredited center at Northwest Medical Center in Margate, Florida. Um, he's been an MIS and bariatric surgeon for in private practice for about 20 years. And um, he did a surgical residency program at the Broward District Hospital System in Florida. But he originally hails from Canada, I believe. And uh, the good news is, is that he speaks French. So he's going to give his talk in English today. Dr. Wisman. You're on mute, Dr. Wisman. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. It is an honor to be with all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harris, for inviting me, and Dr. Ortiz, for all those kind words for everybody. Let me just share my screen here. All right. So I've been asked to talk about um, basically the sleeve gastrectomy performed at an outpatient a surgical center. And uh, the way I'm going to introduce this is just to tell you my path. In other words, I'm a, I'm a bariatric surgeon in private clinical practice for many, many years. And there came a point where the hospital work that I was doing was unsatisfying. In other words, uh, there was a push toward outpatient center, but the, it wasn't really the right recipe. For years, I was on the fence with it. People would approach me left and right, let's do this. And I didn't feel that the combination of what I saw out there and the safety factors and all those other things were kind of matching. And remember that I'm speaking about my world in Florida. Now, Florida is different from Texas, is different from California, is different from New York City, is different from Montreal, is different from where you guys are listening from all over the world. So what applies to me may not apply to you precisely, but the aspect with which the surgeon, we look at things is always from the same kind of angle. And that is safety, safety, efficiency, and longevity. You don't wanna go into something and it, it all falls apart. We cannot do this alone. I'm really sorry to say this, all, all you surgeons out there who want it to be, it is going to be teamwork. And I'm going to say this again, teamwork is dream work. It's a, it's a sentence that is not easy for a, lo a, a lot of surgeons to, to um, kind of actually appreciate, but it is something that is absolutely crucial in this environment. So I've been doing surgery for a long time. And, and, and that is, I mean, bariatric surgery for a long time. And I think that is unfortunately a key factor. In other words, I don't recommend this if you have not been doing surgery. And, and that is particularly the sleeve gastrectomy for long enough to go through all of the learning curve. And I'm not, I'm not gonna say a particular number, although 500 kind of, um, is, is the minimum, I would, I would probably think. You, you probably have to be at the point where you can do a month or two months of cases with, with the minimal of complications. In other words, reach the level where uh, you have mastered the surgery. Of course, we're never gonna get out of the fact we're gonna have complications, but you should be at a point where you're very comfortable with this procedure. So that having been said, okay, the first requirement or the first ingredient, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use that theme. The first ingredient is a surgical ingredient. And that means that the surgeon has to be in the point of the practice where it's going to uh, not uh, impinge upon the outcome and the safety. Okay, I'll leave it at that. So why outpatient surgical center? First of all, it's lower cost to payers and patients. And in my market in Florida, I'm working with self-pay patients. In other words, the private patient. Now in insurance patients, um, I'm sure we can talk about it in another session. I don't do a lot of that. My basic outpatient center experience is twofold. The first was a small um, kind of loophole in the insurance system where we, where we were able to go out of network. And I don't think that's as important 
uh, to my talk as uh, as perhaps another talk. First of all, that loophole is, is closing pretty rapidly. But most of my cases are done in the private sector. Okay, so improve. I also wanted improved access to care. So when somebody does not have bariatric benefits, and that's a very large portion of a po po our population here in the United States, they can have that, that, that uh, choice. The satisfaction I will show to be better through my talk. Um, also in the age of COVID, and this really propelled us tremendously uh, into kind of like the standard of care range. At first we were seen as outliers, like, you know, uh, the fact that we were doing outpatient centers was not something that all uh, of our community appreciated. But once uh, COVID started, it really propelled us into the safety zone, I'm gonna say. So also we can specialize our care there. It's quicker discharge and recovery. And, and in my belief, and I'm sure you're all feeling it, it's the future direction of healthcare. There are, however, safety concerns. And these are sometimes um, uh, not actually reality. These are perceptions that I'm gonna tell you, but some are reality, but some are perceptions, but you know that perception can be reality. So it's important to allay those fears. So the population, there's also potential medical legal exposure. Hiring and training of staff is perceived to be difficult. The lack of training perceived as a means of financial gain is also a perception. Uh, bariatric accreditation may be needed in certain markets. I'm gonna tell you right now that that is not an issue for myself in Florida. It may be an issue for others. I understand that. There's also a hospital competition which creates adversarial um, communication, unfortunately. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the studies. I'm gonna leave that to you, uh, Dr. Billing. I think you've done most of them anyways. So I'll leave that to you. But uh, Daniel Cottom has been instrumental in, in, in kind of guiding us, the private physicians into this, uh, as have you, Dr. Billing, of course. But there was a retrospective study uh, involving uh, over 3,000 patients and the sleeve gastrectomy with 21 surgeons, basically showing, as I've shown you here, that it's safe. I can go over the, the, the minutia. I don't think it's necessary. It is well within the standard of care. And the particular thing I want you to see here is the transfer. You see the transfer number. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So who are the participants or what are the ingredients? We already talked about the surgeon ingredient and, and the surgeon ingredient, it has to be a mature surgeon. Now I am single surgeon. I, I probably have done about two or 3000 uh, outpatient cases myself over the last 10 years. And uh, probably in the range of five or 600 robotic cases as well. I do all kinds of surgery there. That again, that is absolutely individual. And I, I'm not a proponent for doing a, a SIPS or, or a, a revisional bariatric surgery outpatient. Although I do that, I, I'm not gonna tell you that that's <clears throat> the standard that should be done. Obviously you start with a sleeve gastrectomy and you start simply, but you can go on and do uh, whatever you feel comfortable as, a, as an institution. The second thing I want to talk about is the way it happened to me was that I didn't feel comfortable. Once I knew that I, I, I found my, my third party payer, in other words, my administrative uh, uh, angle, and I was comfortable with the administration because I'm not an administrator. I do not do anything with the administration. I do not do anything with the facility. I'm strictly a surgeon that comes in and does the work. And I think that speaks for a lot of us. We, we, don't, we can't handle that kind of administration. So where do we feel safe in a business perspective? That's something that uh, has to be done first. So I felt comfortable with the business relationship. And then my next move, which was absolutely crucial, was anesthesia for me. So what I did was I made sure that the facility and those business partners understood that I would not do this surgery unless I was very comfortable with my anesthesia component. So I selected anesthesia, they were good with that. So once I had that core, because remember the anesthesiologist, in my opinion, has to have the same maturity in bariatrics as you do. So you're the surgeon, 
you're doing the surgery, but the anesthesiologist has to be the bariatric anesthesiologist, not just anybody, but somebody who can handle and has handled what has happened. So these things can come up uh, in a kind of, it's kind of scary not to have good backup. And, I, and I'm not saying that the anesthesiologist is backup, that's part of our team. Next, obviously, is the, uh, is the staff. And the staff I have found really is, again, the same thing, mature bariatric staff. So you find those people that have worked with you and in the outpatient uh, place, it's a place of efficiency. You're gonna see that those people will come up and just help you right away. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to work with those people you've worked with in an outpatient center. Uh, next, obviously, is the, um, is the nurses in the recovery. And I have found that by far and away, recovery room nurses are the best. In my opinion, I've tried everybody. I've tried CRNAs, I've tried uh, uh, floor nurses, I've tried uh, um, PAs, uh, uh, NPs. I think what works the best is recovery room nurses because they know exactly how to recover a patient. And again, you can get these people from every day working with them in the hospital. So how, who do we take? What about the patients? We use the low acuity patient and procedure selection. Um, and we're not bound by this, by the way. So again, this is absolutely individual. I'm not going to tell you that this is a rock hard uh, yes or no. Patients go through and I and me, myself and the anesthesiologist, again, that's where the anesthesiologist counts. We go through this and we see who are the uh, candidates who are, are gonna be safe. And this again involves maturity, individual selection and teamwork. Now I put this up uh, a couple of years ago. So the weight, uh, I, I think that uh, I don't go over 400 pounds absolute on an outpatient center and that's my thing. And I, I try to stay under 55 BMI. Now we all know as surgeons that you can have a 50 BMI male that is absolutely impossible to operate on. And you can have a 55 BMI male that is very easy. So, you know, uh, I think it, it, it comes down again, unfortunately, to maturity and decision-making as a team. I like, to, I like to think that we're under two hours operative time. I'm not gonna start uh, with, uh, I can do a sleeve in uh, 35 minutes and all that stuff. I'm just gonna say this. The team should be able to take the patient in and out of the room in less than two hours. I think that's pretty important. Doesn't matter how fast you are after that. You can be super fast. I know Nick, Nick Nicholson is gonna chime in on this one probably, uh, but uh, you can be adequately fast, but you have to be efficient. And I think efficiency means different thing for different people. I don't, I don't, I'm not a proponent of doing 10, 15 cases a day, but you should be able to do four to six probably. So we probably do in the range of four to eight cases a day, um, and, and, you know, we can finish by two or three in the afternoon. I think that's okay. I'm not going to start telling you that you have to do it, this or that, but you start slow. That's all. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to tell you that my patient is taken through exactly what I do for an inpatient patient. It's the absolute workup. You have to do the same thing for these patients as anybody else. Doesn't matter how they're paying. Doesn't matter who they are. Uh, how's my time, by the way? Am I uh, still okay? Okay. Uh, they go through a, a, a preoperative nutrition class. I have a PA that's a nutritionist and we do everything we're supposed to do. And I think that's extremely important. I think surgeons are very, they te we, we tend to be very strong on the front end and the front end is very important. Don't get me wrong. I think it's really important. But I think what, where, where the weakness lies sometimes is on the back end. Don't leave a patient stranded. Don't leave a bariatric patient stranded on the back end. I think that's extremely important. <clears throat> we use the ERAS protocol or some SEM. Look, I, I made my own. It's a little bit different, but the two things I love about the protocol that I use are one that we use as little narcotic as possible. 
That's one. And two, Sugamidex. So, Sugamidex is a reversal agent that is, I'm going to use the expression massively fantastic. It's pretty expensive, unfortunately, but it really has, is, a, is a little bit of a game changer. It, it really is. So look into that. Uh, <clears throat> so there are different ways to stay safe. And I'm just going to tell you the few things that I do to make sure that I'm safe. One is that I use bipolar energy because there, are, there is bleeding. Bleeding can never, unfortunately, go away. There's always going to be the potential for bleeding. And that is our one danger point. You could probably manage a leak. Unfortunately, if it happens, you could probably manage it. You could uh, probably portal uh, venous thrombosis and other complications happen later. But the bleed is the thing that keeps the patient uh, in danger. And we in Florida can keep the patient overnight. I probably would not do this surgery. I probably would not do this surgery if I could not keep the patient overnight. That's me in Florida. And that's our standard of care. Again, it's different slightly in different areas. Just gonna say that. And the thing you can do here in the greater curve is you can do ligature or by, I'm gonna say bipolar, but you can also clip each vessel. There's nothing wrong with going. There's nothing wrong here, for instance, with clipping these vessels and then putting bipolar in. There's absolutely nothing wrong. Having said that, it may take you four or five minutes longer. What are we going to do about that? But again, what are you going to do with the bleeding patient that has a heart rate of 125 and it's four o'clock in the morning in your outpatient center? What are you going to do about that? So, you know, that's your comfort level. I don't clip. I don't, but I, I do leave a very long pedicle. See, just in case I do have to come back, I leave that pedicle as long as I can because it's something, it's something to hold on to. That's just my way. So just try to take as, as big a pedicle as you can so you can hold it in case you have to get some bleeding. Another example of that long pedicle. And below which here, you see the, the short gastric vessel. That vessel tends to bleed from the bottom up because it's a branch of the splenic artery. So it's kind of hard to get. So remember when you're down there, uh, and this is a, obviously a crazy long example, but here's a long, Nice pedicle in case you got to go and get it. When I staple, okay, and I'm just going over my technique, that's all. I'm not saying it's the absolute way to do it. I don't take too much antrum. I always look at the pylorus because it can be in a different place here and there. And I uh, just wanted to show one spot here. You see that, that spot? Can you see my uh, arrow? Do you see the, my mouse? Okay, so that little spot there, be careful, because it can bleed there afterwards, in my experience. So I, I just stay, you see, I stay away from the crow foot here. You just keep it wide here, and then you come in. That's, that's, that's my technique. And you see that I'm not holding the other side of the stomach. I just keep the tension free and always parallel. So that's my technique of sleeve. And again, we have a standard hospital recovery room protocol by a, 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 a bariatric, a, a, not necessarily a bariatric post-op nurse, but a, a post-operative nurse. Now you see the transfer agreement. I'm just gonna say one quick word about transfer agreement. I like to think that you have a transfer bariatric surgeon agreement. How's that? It could be you in a perfect world, it is you. So you have the transfer agreement with yourself. So you can transfer that patient to your hospital, but that's not always possible. And in a couple of places where I work, it is not possible. So what I do is I have, I have a bariatric surgeon that I communicate with and I have an agreement with, with him slash her. And that way, I know that they're not gonna take a patient that had a little bit of bleeding and bring it back into the OR or do something that I don't want them to do or do something that I want them to do, they will. So that's a really important caveat. I really, really 
cannot stress that as much. I don't know in your territory how important that is. You may be in a system where you have total access, but do have a transfer agreement with a surgeon. Discharge basically 7 a.m. We give them, we give my, our sleep patients anticoagulation that we can just talk about later, but I've had some portal vein thrombosis before I instituted this and very, very few afterwards. Uh, Peter, maybe you have some statistics on that. Then we follow our patients up the next week. So we see them all between five and seven days post-op. I wanna stop there because I may have run over the time, I'm sorry. Thank you. Professor Schauer, do you want to start with, with the first question? Sure, Dr. Wiseman, uh, thank you. That was uh, a tremendous presentation. And wow, thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing um, your many years of experience in this area. Um, the statement that you made, I thought was, um, was important in that you said that outpatient sleeve gastrectomy uh, is safe. And I wonder if you'd be willing to say that it is safe in carefully selected patients because it seems like that's what you're doing. You're primarily doing the procedure on self-pay patients who, who in general are lower risk patients. They're younger, uh, they're middle-class or above, they're educated, they tend to have lower risk. And you also qualified you know, patients who you would exclude. So would you agree with that statement that it's safe, but in carefully selected patients? Yeah, Phil, uh, thank you, by the way. Uh, yeah, exactly. And curiously, there are, two, there are two populations. One is that I'm not gonna say underweight because I think you all know what I mean by that, under the standard bariatric weight patients that have trouble getting insurance. Uh, but the other population are those people that are way overweight, that have been waiting a long time, they have no access to care, and finally they find somebody who can do this at a decent price, and they're not healthy people, and they have no insurance, and those are the danger, those are the dangerous people, and I, I want to tell everybody that th those people have, you. that's my warning, be careful with that patient. Treat them the right way. If it's a big boy who mustered up some money and has no access to healthcare, you still need to do the right thing. You cannot do this person in an outpatient center. That's all. Yeah. And Dr. Wise, just one other real quick question. It's about definitions. I, I, I think I heard that you keep your patients overnight. Yeah. Uh, when we think of outpatient, we think of people going home the same day. Most of us who do this surgery primarily in the hospital keep the patient overnight and send them home you know, the next day. So what's the difference? Uh, should we call that outpatient surgery? Uh, uh, yeah, and, and again, uh, that's a fantastic question. The, the so-called ambulatory surgery is 23 hours and 59 minutes and 59 seconds, literally. I'm not saying that as, a, as an approximation. It is illegal to keep them one minute over. So that so the definition of outpatient in Florida or I, I think anywhere in the United States is less than 24 hours. Now, before we could keep them overnight, it was really difficult, and I'm, and there are even legal ramifications of putting them in hotels and all that here. It's extremely dangerous. There are legal problems with that situation right now in plastic surgery. So what the problem I was having is what happens if a patient is going to have a bleed and what to do with them. So I keep them 23 hours. They, they, they leave at about five or 6 a.m., all of them. But I don't keep them over 24 hours. If I had, a, if I had no choice, then I'd have to send them in the evening. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that in, in the next talks. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Paul, I, I just wanted to, first of all, point out to everyone that when you operate on people in a center like this who don't have insurance, there's a huge number of people that do not have insurance. In, our, in the United States, 
we often point to corporations that have more than a thousand people and we're very proud of the fact that 65 70 percent of them are covered but in the vast majority of companies in the United States who have less than 100 pay people in the company or less than 50, there's virtually no coverage that you can buy for any money. And so, you know, it really is putting, it's creating a two-tiered system between those who can access treatment for their diabetes, Phil, um, and those who cannot. And so I really applaud the effort that you and others have made to build an outpatient model where people can come and pay cash and, and try to get the treatment that they need. So that's just one thing I wanted to say to you and to everybody on the call. Yeah. But um, the question I had for you is, is um, what is your, you know, like, what is your level of comfort or discomfort with this? You know, it sounds to me like you've kind of had an evolution where you believe that what you're doing is safe, but you don't take it for granted. You're not cocky about it. It's not like, oh, I can do this at an outpatient center, yada, yada. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I really love that approach that you're taking. And I just wondered, emotionally, have there ever been times where you've really struggled with this? Oh, yeah, oh, uh, many times. Uh, I, By the way, I, I got to say that just on your first point, uh, let me answer the second one in a second, but on the first point, he, Michelle, you could talk about also that even in a system where there is insurance for everyone, there, there, there needs to be a two tier. We, we're forced to have two tier sy system here, but in Canada, for instance, a two tier system exists because there is still isn't access to care. So I don't know if any system works perfectly without two tiers. Now, remember I mentioned, uh, is that, isn't that right, Michelle? Well, you'll, you'll tell us more. But, yeah, but yeah, I was going to, I, I was going to say that, <clears throat> um, first of all, I, I understand well the administration because I, I'm the owner of two military surgical center in Canada in a system where there's a sea of public health, you know, hospitals. And I still have to do the, the surgeries exactly as Paul uh, mentioned. And it is the surgeon who works in a military surgical center is forcing is forced to do better surgery than in a major hospital because there's no backup, no backup. You, ob you often have to operate alone like in an academic center you have help with residents and fellows and so forth you're totally alone um, you can't have a complication because you don't have ICU you don't have anything you don't have consultants on on the, on the site and uh, you tend to choose better your patient, prepare better your patient, and exclude some of the patients you think are going to be a problem. And I, I agree with Paul. The, the bleeding patients in sleep gastrectomy is the number one problem for me. It's not a leak. The leak is not going to happen in less than 24 hours. Usually it will happen some days later out when the patient is not there anymore. Uh, there could be some cardiac uh, arrhythmia. There could be some airway problem with anesthesia. It happens from time to time, but usually that's not a big problem. But the bleeding is one, and it has forced me to change the way I do my sleeves. Um, I, uh, I give tranexamic acid now on everybody, and I've been doing this for years. Um, I don't start anticoagulation now. I start anticoagulation when they leave. And I found out that there was no difference in, in DVT uh, uh, access in, in many people who've done that instead of pre-op versus post-op the next day. Um, we don't have any transfusion unit. We have no blood at all on site. So that is, that is by law here <laughs> in Canada, we cannot have blood on the site. So you have, I clip all the vessels along the greater curvature, not on the stomach side, but on the uh, side where it stays. So it takes me an extra 10 minutes just to clip mm -hmm. vessels because I've learned that those vessels can bleed. Um, I, I also put six. sutures on the greater curvature um, <laughs> on, on those trans transection. So I was wondering, Paul, if you've changed your practice uh, for bleeding. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what I've done. First of all, I used to go in with a visi port right through the middle, right? And I, I've been, look, thank God, 
I just want, you know, we have to be a little bit superstitious. I'm not a hockey player, but there is a little superstition in us. But now I'm using Palmer's point out patient. So I, I'm not even going in that middle spot because I, there, I can't have, a, in other words, Michelle said the magic sentence, we cannot have a complication. It's not that we don't want one, we cannot. So that changes the game a little bit. So first of all, I go in in the left upper quadrant instead of the midline. I, I, I close all the fascia, uh, no matter what the port is. It takes me a little bit longer. And I put some clips where, you know, I haven't put a lot of clips in and I've been fighting that a lot because I don't want to spend an extra five minutes, Michelle. <laughs> There's always that battle between the best thing and the quickest thing. It's the, it's a, it's a struggle of our lives. Okay. But anyways, yes, I have changed my practice for bleeding, in, indeed. And by the way, we don't well, have, Michelle, in the United States, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have transfusions here. We do not. Also, we cannot yeah. have blood in the outpatient center. There you go. All right. One, one last question before we pass to our next speaker. Uh, this kind of is like really up my alley because uh, we've been uh, uh, doing surgery the past 27 years in uh, ambulatory setting, high volume, international setting, <laughs> uh, private setting, and uh, a lot of lessons learned from uh, we pu uh, presented 19,000 plus patients at this last ASMBS. Um, and my question would be to you, have you had an issue where your patients are not local and they have to be somewhat uh, restrained from traveling immediately after surgery? Because as we know, that's where the complications can arise a uh, few days after surgery. Uh, for uh, it's for Michelle the question. Uh, uh, well, no, I can I, I, you, I, I can say I can say that that Canada is such a big country that sometimes flying six hours is like going to London, but we have patients from Vancouver flying to Montreal, and that's six hours flight. We tell them to stay four or five days before they leave, so they will usually because it's not their home stay in a hotel downtown. And, and, and we want to make sure there's no major issues before they fly back home. I don't, I don't know, Paul, if you have patients uh, in Florida it's not, it's, who are it's coming exactly. from California. Yeah. No, I don't get the Californias because uh, uh, the two presenters take most of them on the way. Uh, the two other presenters capture most of the people on the way. They don't make it to Florida. <laughs> and Dr. Dr. Ortiz takes a lot of them, sucks the ones down from Miami. So I basically... <laughs> no, it's it's just, uh, we do get internationals. We get, um, about, I get uh, a lot from the Bahamas and four or five days, exactly. I just want to get out of that period where, and by the way, I don't know if you've had any, um, uh, any, uh, a problem with portal vein thrombosis. Michelle, have you seen that? You have to have seen it. I've rarely seen it. Uh, you know, I've had patients who had pulmonary emboli, and I, I've been wondering about the incidence of that with tranexamic acid, yeah. because it doesn't act on the same, uh, with the same mechanism in the uh, in the cascade of, uh, of coagulation and okay. anticoagulation. So uh, I've given them in patients even that have histories of uh, pulmonary emboli DVT, although they are, those patients are on enoxyparin pre-op and they stay for prolonged uh, um, anticoagulation. But I think the incidence is uh, almost not different. So what I don't know about tranexamic acid is really the dose I have to give. I give one gram, but this is just crap shoot. Maybe it's two grams, maybe it's three grams. I don't know that. They have dramatically guys... decreased the bleeding. I mean, it's I have transfers that is unheard of now because of bleeding. But before that, we used to get you know one to two percent. Michelle, I, I really want to speak on this topic because I think it's things that's going to threaten all of our practices. Is uh, portal vein thrombosis causing acute uh, bowel ischemia? And uh, we've seen three cases of this. And uh, one patient ended up in an outside facility and uh, unfortunately died. And this is such a, a huge event. So the ones that uh, we've seen that we can manage, we put a, a catheter into the portal vein and put TPA. And that within hours, 
relieve the obstruction and relieve the, the bowel ischemia. And I think this is the, the, the algorithm that must be used for patients who have uh, severe bowel ischemia and septic okay. shock. Yeah. yeah, you got to have an interventional radiologist willing to do that. But I, I've been able to talk our interventional radiologists into doing it. And even the, the universities here it, it was reluctant to do that. So we did it at our hospital and uh, both patients uh, survived and are the happiest patients ever. But it will take patients lives. Especially when, uh, if I may interject, especially when you're dealing with a patient <laughs> that has no clue of the lethality of this really rare complication and you don't really talk about it much and then no. all of a sudden life and death it's it's crazy it's dangerous it's extremely it's, rare thank god but yeah something we all know about when you reach a certain maturity and and have to deal with peter right. I, 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 I mean we've all been uh hit with uh, patients with pe and, and and had the major event with that but we need to think about this and borrow perhaps from our orthopedic colleagues who give aspirin post-operatively for one month for total joints. I think there, there's something there and we need to uh, better understand what's going on with uh, the pathophysiology of the blood flow and why there's stasis and uh, clot being formed in the port of vein. You guys, we have some questions online that we might want to get to. Um, Peter, I didn't know if, you'd, if you saw those. I, I see the questions. Uh, how do you deal with it? that may increase surgical time, such as adhesions? Or uh, I, I'm pretty aggressive about fixing hiatal hernias. I do that about 40% of the time. And 90% uh, of our patients, their GERD uh, practically goes away. Uh, but they can come back. Uh, it does increase the time about by 15 minutes. Uh, and then adhesions, well, if they're in the mid abdomen, you know, you just need to get access to the upper abdomen. Uh, we've done a lot of band to sleeve conversions. I don't recommend that in, in starting out, but uh, there's a lot of adhesions there. And, uh, we bring in a second surgeon uh, or someone who's really competent at, at, at assisting to get those cases done quickly. Uh, so I, I think a lot of the comments that uh, Paul said, I, I totally concur with uh, about patient selection because if you're choosing patients that are, have high BMIs and had previous abdominal surgery, it's gonna just lengthen the time and potential complications. And one thing that I see some surgeons do is they'll do a band to sleeve together, take the band out. We, we don't, uh, we just found it safer to do it in two separate operations, let the stomach heal up a while and then bring them back. The patients aren't too upset about it, but they'll, they'll still ask about it. So whatever you can minimize, just go in and do what you need to do and get done. Hey, Paul, Robin, Phil, Michelle, Santiago, Jorge, I'm sorry I was late, but I was finishing an operation that went over. That, that was a great, great uh, fair presentation. A couple of things, we have 12,000 viewers so far, so that's pretty good number, well done. And uh, trying to stay on time, I'm going to pass it to Phil Shower that we all know well, uh, who's going to continue with the program. Phil. Very good. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Nick Nicholson. And he is a very experienced surgeon from Texas. He has been performing bariatric surgery for several decades and performs all the various types of procedures. He, in particular, has a lot of experience with outpatient sleeve gastrectomy, which he'll be talking about. And his discussion today will be about uh, buttressing the staple line for sleeve gastrectomy. So take it away, Nick. Great. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great, great. Well, listen, you know, at times like these, everybody likes to thank everybody uh, for, uh, for the invitation to speak. I'd like to, to do that as well as just uh, there's too many people to, uh, to enumerate on this, to put something like this together that's been uh, going so well. Um, the other thing I would like to say is, uh, Paul, I thought that given the time constraints, that was an excellent talk, and I echo just about everything you said. Um, so with that in mind, um, let me make sure that I've uh, got my act together here. 
So what we're asked is, is if whether or not buttressing of a staple line is effective, whether or not that helps with our ability to confidently and, and consistently send people home the same day. And, and just with some starting off on that, you know, obviously the answer to that is, uh, is, is does any one individual practice guarantee anything in medicine? The answer to that is no. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, if you use it in certain practices and you choose your patients correct, correctly, can it help? Um, my view on that is it absolutely can. Um, you know, basically, this comes down to it dovetails nicely with what Paul spoke about a minute ago. You know, most of our same day discharges are going to be all about patient selection. Uh, and then there's an enormous amount of uh, management of the patient's expectations up front. If we're discussing this with them like this is a gallbladder that they should be going home from, uh, then you know, they're going to have some different expectations about when to return to work, whether that's from home or whether that's in person. Uh, and they're prepared rather than feeling like they're getting kicked out of the, out of the ASC or the hospital. And then the other thing that I think is, is paramount to this, if you looked at Paul's slide with all of the people that go into this process, um, there is really an, a large amount of time and resources, in my opinion, that you need to invest upfront on this in order to make this a well-oiled machine for patients, because you cannot have people at home feeling like, well, if I'd have been in the hospital, somebody would have gone over my medications with me. I might not have forgotten X, Y, or Z. Um, it, this really does take a village and a lot of people to be involved. And you also have to have everybody on the same page. Dietitian has to be communicating the same way that the pre-op nurse is communicating and the same way that your anesthesiologist is communicating too. So let's talk about the specific aspect of staple line reinforcement. And, and quite honestly, in our practice, what I can say is, is with the only thing I can say with certainty is that it really does simply for me, it adds an additional layer of confidence when I'm sending people home the same day. Um, as an example, uh, in July, um, our group uh, as a whole did 129 cases, 65 of those were at an ASC. Um, those are primary sleeves, those are band sleeves, uh, and those are revisions of sleeves, simply resecting a dilated fundus. We do not do our bypasses in an ASC uh, or any uh, duodenal switches. Um, that particular July, there were no 30-day readmits. Um, it, admittedly, we'll usually have about one patient a month that will, one or two in the summertime in Texas that will go back to either the ER or an infusion center just because we tend to have these little things called heat waves and people get dehydrated quite a bit. Uh, but that is, uh, in terms of readmits, that's a pretty typical month. Uh, and we send quite a few of our hospital-based cases home the same day as well. So basically, you know, close to 60% of all of our patients go home the same day, which, you know, as Paul alluded to, there's a lot of efficiencies in terms of quality of life for the surgeons and the practice. And quite frankly, here in Texas, when we, and I'm sure it's the same way around the world, um, that really came in handy during COVID when we really had a bed crunch and we needed to make sure that we were able to uh, still get our patients the care they needed and same quality, but we were able to send them home and uh, when we didn't have access to an OR. So if we look at staple line reinforcement, um, over we've been using that since, in our practice personally since 2002. Um, you know, a lot of the original products were bovine pericardium. Um, we've since moved to absorbable polymers. Um, but when you look at the things that, it, that happened there, granted, nowadays, the staplers are vastly improved in terms of the different generation they're on from 20 some odd years ago. Uh, but what we saw in 2002, and we were only doing laparoscopic bypasses, um, but we, and the, the data I could not find this far out, but it definitely, uh, from an observational standpoint, decreased our bleeding uh, 20 years ago. 
Uh, it decreased our leak rate on our bypasses. Um, some things that I saw that were kind of esoteric, but I thought were important to me. Uh, at the time, we were uh, teaching a lot of residents and we had a large residency program. And uh, I really felt like the staple line reinforcement kind of gave them something to hold on to rather than grabbing on to the bowel. And, you know, I think that's one thing that is huge. When, when we were making the jump to same day surgery, uh, one of my biggest problems was post-op nausea uh, for our sleeves, just having come from the world of bypasses. The sleeves it, initially, when we were making them, I, I felt like a lot of my sleeves got a lot more nauseated. And once they started throwing up, then they would get this like mucosal edema of their sleeve and uh, they couldn't leave the hospital for about 36, 48 hours. So, you know, I started realizing we needed to be a lot more gentle with the, uh, with the sleeve itself. I, I've expanded that to bypasses. Um, the other thing is I really uh, bought into all of the staplers and the staple line reinforcement companies when they show us all of the uh, things that are happening on a, on a macro or micro level. And uh, I really got to paying attention to how the staple, uh, staples themselves form, uh, the importance of the physics involved in that. And what I personally saw was when we added staple line reinforcement, I could see the formation of the staples better. Um, it just gave me a little bit better feeling in the back of my mind. And again, I don't, I don't know why, back to Paul's uh, hockey player reference, maybe we're all a little superstitious. Um, but speaking of superstition, the question now has become a very hot topic of is staple line reinforcement really needed? You know, we, we've, we've got better staplers. Um, so I would ask the question, given that all of us really do have the feeling and we tend to say, well, my, my particular mousetrap is working well in my area. So why should I change? Uh, fair you know, uh, but, but we still need to make progress and we need to be able to be more efficient. And let's talk about, you know, the cash pay aspects of this because staple line reinforcement is not cheap and we could really change our outpatient offering cash pay price if we could comfortably get rid of this. So, so let's say, let's just look at it from, does this make a significant clinical difference? And as one of our esteemed moderators on, the, uh, on, on this talk today, uh, published several years ago, uh, this was a great review. Uh, went back comprehensively and grabbed uh, over 1,600 articles uh, to look at the actual leak rates with and without various types of staple line reinforcement. Um, there was an absolute clinical significant, clinically significant difference with absorbable uh, polymers versus none at 0.73 versus 1.8. So obviously two, two and a half times there. Interesting when we looked at the bovine pericardium that that number went up. Um, just to a word on that, because I do find when this comes up, a lot of people will throw out, well, I think bovine pericardium strips caused more problems than they solved. Um, that's a matter for a different to uh, topic, but uh, but what we did find from, uh, from a study about six, about seven, eight years ago from Barrett was that bovine pericardium tended to increase the, the leak rate. It definitely increased the reoperations and the readmits. Um, again, a lot more to, to unpack there, but, but did want to acknowledge that given the nature of this talk. Thought a really interesting one that came out this year. Um, a lot of people we're, uh, are using robots. Uh, the question with staple line reinforcement is, uh, do those staplers really, are they designed for that? Well, the answer is no, they're not designed for that. Um, so some people, however, still want to use staple line reinforcement. The uh, one uh, approach that's been offered is to use one, one half, just use it on one side of the staple fire. Um, and if you look at the results there, I think there was a definitely a clinically significant difference there in the bleed published rate of 0% with all reinforcing and 2.8 with only half. Um, Raul came up with a, uh, a consensus statement 
about 10 years ago, which uh, we're now getting to see whether or not that was proven correct. Basically, uh, the consensus panel of experts agreed that there was a 100% agreement that staple line reinforcement should ultimately lead to reduced staple line bleeds. So, so I think you know clearly we have uh, we have seen that that uh, that that bears out in terms of these statistics when we're talking about small infrequent occurrences, but they have huge impacts on us long term. So let let's talk about that impact. You know, um, much like several people uh, on this call, you know, half of our patients are cash. Uh, that's that trend is not going away, and the question really becomes, there's a two-tiered aspect to your cash pay patients. Uh, do they have insurance and they simply don't have bariatric benefits or do they have nothing? Because that was what we were talking about in the uh, question and answer session just a moment ago. You know, the patient that I believe it was Paul that referred to that is you know, clearly very ill, has is not insurable in, uh, in whatever state they live in, and has managed to save enough money to barely have one of these surgeries. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very big deal for them. It's a huge investment, and they cannot afford a complication. Um, I would proffer that the surgeons really uh, can't afford a complication either. Uh, there's a lot of things that people may or may not take into account, but if you look at, uh, you know, the number one uh, referral source for us is previous patients. It really doesn't matter about putting up fancy billboards or ads or having the hospital mail out stuff. Uh, the number one source of referrals for us is happy previous patients. And if you have a leak, um, a lot of people saw that. And that really impacts everyone in the, in the whole system and in the healthcare community because the public's perception of weight loss surgery just got it another ding against it. Um, obviously, the impact on the patient's life uh, is huge. Uh, and as anybody here can, can attest, you know, the impact on the surgeon's quality of life, uh, of life is just huge. I mean, you know, you feel terrible, you're, you're, you're miserable, you're obviously there's an emotional toll. Um, and then the, from the practical standpoint, there's a scheduling problem. I mean, this thing is a disaster if you are at an ASC. Will they let you take a patient back that's bleeding acutely? You don't have blood. Do you have to transfer them? That's very exciting when we get to put everybody in an ambulance and send them somewhere because then the family sees that. So uh, that, 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 that has a lot of downstream impact. Um, has impact on your referrals too, um, whether that's from physicians or previous patients, but you get some online reviews out there in this day and age and that's, that's not helpful. So, uh, so that's something real and something that should be considered. Um, let's, let's look at it from a yeah, but standpoint of, well, how does that affect me? Well, let's take a program that would be robust. And as an example, uh, 40 cases a month. We've looked at all the literature. Let's say that they have a, uh, including leaks and bleeds as one category, uh, just for argument's sake. Let's say they have a one to 2% clinically significant leak or bleed, okay? Uh, 2% is 10 cases. If we can reduce that number by one or two, that's a 10 to 20% reduction in our major complications. And those are events that we all remember for months and months to come. So the point is if we can barely move the needle even by one or two people, in one or two complications a year, a major complication, I think most people in the audience would agree that that's probably something worth investigating. Um, and we got to talk about the cost and the, uh, of, a, of a leak or a bleed. Um, you know, the staple line reinforcement, as I said, it is not cheap. The cost of, of a sleeve at our ASC with staple line reinforcement is about $3,000 before they start adding in the staff and uh, everything else. That's with our disposables, trocars, staplers, uh, what have you. Um, you know, our cost for the staple line reinforcement, uh, depending on uh, around town, depending on that's a contracting issue with the entity, could be as low as 500 per case, could go as high as 1400. 
Uh, at our ASC, we're paying between 850 and 900 per case. So I could drop that cost literally by almost a third if we got rid of that. Uh, but there are numerous studies that show what the cost of a leak or a bleed is. Um, and those can easily uh, exceed $100,000. Uh, now, granted, that the, the question is who, assume, who absorbs that $100,000 cost? Uh, but, but either way, uh, not a good thing. Um, Conclusion on all of this, I, you know, I, I, I think that there are people that I uh, teach, there's people that I see, I watch them do a completely hand-sewn gastrojejunostomy in two layers. Uh, there are people that simply staple that with an EEA and call it a day. Uh, is one right or wrong? You know, no, nobody's wrong there. Uh, I think it really boils down to the how you practice and uh, what your what your current uh, demographics look like. Do you have a bunch of smokers? Do you have a bunch of people that are going to be higher risk from bleeding? A bunch of diabetics, um, and, and 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 what you, is going to give people the peace of mind to allow somebody to go home uh, in a faster fashion than than an overnight stay? And I just think every little bit uh, of belt and suspenders that we can put on this. Uh, from my standpoint, the better while still being fiscally responsible. So I'll uh, turn that over for questions and I appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, Nick. That was a super presentation. Very interesting. I just wonder, you know, since the cost is so high. Can you, can you hear me? Robin, um, can you, what? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah Robin there you are. is talking. We can hear you now. <laughs> okay, okay. So, Robin, go, go ahead. I was asking a question, but I'll let you go. Go first. Oh, I didn't hear. I didn't hear it. Sorry about no that, Santi. So, my question's really quick, and that is you know, you've talked about the cost and the benefit of using reinforcement. There are other techniques that reinforce with a $3 suture, um, you know, over sewing or imbricating the staple line. Uh, takes a few more minutes, but um, trans it's very translatable within that two hour window that we talked about earlier. You know, have you ever thought about just um, comparing the two techniques because it seems like that's le much less expensive for your environment, especially. Yeah, that's a great point, Robin. And actually um, we kind of do throw the kitchen sink at this thing anyway. Um, I will usually clip where my staple lines cross um, we, depending on which facility we are at, we will use um, uh, a uh, fiber and glue as well. Um, we sometimes do put sutures in if the staple line does not look uh, like they formed completely uh, or as well as we want. But to your question, no, we've never done a straight up, I'll uh, put some stitches on this one or over sew the the, the staple line as opposed to simply not using any reinforcement. So let me, that, Robin, that, that, that was a great question and a good lead to my question because, uh, you know, I, I am a true believer until today of uh, reinforcement, but as of last year, and, and we created a partnership with Ariel and we were working together in Tijuana, as you know, and we look at Ariel's data. Um, he, he did 20,000 surgeries with only 30 bleedings, and, and he doesn't do any reinforcement. So I think that I don't see anyone better to speak to that. Uh, Ariel, uh, can you have zero uh, uh, um, reinforcements. You implicate the, the staple nine, and your bleeding rate is extremely low, and you have only one leak out of 20,000 searches. Because we look at that data that was presented at ASMBS this year. Can you comment on that, Ariel, please? Well, in terms of, uh, are we talking about completely imbricating the entire staple line from top to bottom? Yeah, that's, that's, that's what Ariel does. And, and they, they are having incredible results. Agree, agree. The problem we saw with that, the only thing, and I can't disagree with the data, the only thing I would point out with that is we've had several people in uh, Dallas that did do that. And the problem we saw was 
Uh, increase in incidence of nausea. A lot of times when they imbricated it, they when you would scope those people, you'd see a lot more of an invagination of the staple line that took up a lot of the uh, intraluminal mass. And I think those are certainly just technique issues. Uh, but the, the one thing I would say is that from our limited experience, I didn't find that particular technique to be that it it was as reproducible or translated across uh, all platforms. For instance, when you fire a staple line, uh, stapler with staple line reinforcement, that's the same in your hands as my hands or a resident. Uh, when we start asking somebody to over sew a staple line, um, how much? And, and that was the part that I think doesn't just universally uh, translate, at least in terms of when we're teaching people. Yeah, so Ariel, Ariel does everything, the, the, the entire step line. I mean, they do 50 surgeries a week. The volume is huge. And, and, and I was uh, gladly surprised about what I saw there. The, the big difference that I saw is intraoperative bleeding. You have more of oozing if you reinforce that step line than when we use reinforcement. Ariel is back. Ariel, you want to comment on that? I'm sorry, I couldn't catch you. broke up for a second. No, Ariel is back. Ariel, you, you want to oh. comment on Ariel? Yeah, yeah, well, the over sewing part is, I kind of, I, after so many years of just doing it, it becomes something of a second nature to us. It's part of the procedure. But ultimately what it really does, once you master it, it really is kind of a second seal. Gives you a little bit of peace of mind that you're releasing a lot of that tension over the staple line. You're uh, over sewing over a, a bougie tube well, you're basically kind of fine tuning that calibration. Uh, but most importantly, it really is a hemostatic procedure as long as you're actually over sewing and imbricating and indenting that staple line. Uh, and that obviously, and, and Santiago, you've told me, it's like with the volume we do, he's like, why don't you have more bleeds? It's like, I don't know, is it the over sewing? But it's something that just becomes second nature uh, to us after so many years of doing it. Michel, comment? Well, um, in that meta-analysis, we did show that over sewing was also decreasing bleeding, but not as much as with the absorbable uh, buttress material, but it did better than nothing. So um, I think if cost is an issue, uh, and it is in most countries, because as you go outside the U.S., the cost goes up. Really, in Canada, uh, the cost of absorbable material is almost 50% to 100 percent higher uh we will uh, we will ask the patient to pay this extra if they want it otherwise we put absorbable suture as the second method and it does better than than nothing so that's my only comment i would say i agree with most comments here yeah i i think my take from everybody's questions is whether it depends on what our definition of staple line reinforcement is, whether that's a suture, whether that's a membrane, whether that's a clip, whether that's an omental patch, I'm not sure. But I think most people are, are, are taking away from this that something is better than simply a unreinforced staple line. Yeah. Any comments? Santiago? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll comment. Yeah. Yeah. For years, um, you know, I agree with uh, those that, uh, that, uh, that advocate over sewing the staple line. It's, it's, it's cheaper. Um, and it's, it's an imbrication. It's not a baseball stitch. If you stitch through the staple line, it's probably making it worse. Um, and it probably, it, it does, you know, both, uh, it, hemostatic, but also another layer of protection for a leak. And I admit that it's, it's hard to get clear data because we just don't have the level one evidence for any of these techniques. But, but uh, what I've done recently is just, you know, over sew the first 10 to 15 centimeters. And then, um, cause that's where, you know, the, all the leaks are going to be at the top there. That's where 99% of leaks are right at the angle of hiss there. And then the remainder, I've been using a surgery cell powder. I don't know if anybody's used that for the staple line. The nice thing about that powder is you can direct it on the staple line, but to Michelle's earlier point, 
You can also put that powder in other areas that may bleed. The mesentery, the divided mesentery, then up by the spleen. Um, and you can direct it there. So I've been using that lately. And it's, it's just one vial, which is probably about the cost of maybe one cartridge, or I'm sorry, one staple line cartridge. So something to think to think about that. I've, I've, uh, I like that approach. The great Absolutely. thing about surgery is, Santi, is there's all these ways to do things, right? <laughs> and they, they all work to some degree. And to your point, Phil, we don't have level one evidence. But I will point out that it's very good practice for residents to learn to imbricate that staple line. Good practice for them for sewing. Yeah, you know, Robin, that, that's, that's an excellent point. And I think that Michelle and, and, and Nick and Ariel brought the issue of cost. Because we need to be more aware of cost. It, it, now that I'm going to Tijuana more often, and I see that my operation in the U.S. costs $25,000, another $1,000 doesn't add much to the game. But when you go to Tijuana where the operation is $8,000, another $1,000 add a lot to the game. And the cost is usually twice what this in the U.S. So I, I think that, that lectures like this one can bring more light to the reality of how, how can we decrease cost by maintaining quality? And, and, and I think that that's the, the ultimate goal. Great. Michelle, you are in charge, I think. Okay, well, thank you for the, I will introduce our last speaker, Dr. Peter Billing. He's an MIS bariatric surgeon and founder of Transform Weight Loss uh, based in Washington State, USA, has an extensive experience in decades uh, sleeve gastrectomy extensive basic and clinical research experience at UCLA and Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. He will be uh, speaking on 10-year experience of same-day sleeve gastrectomy surgery without buttressing. Peter. Thanks, Thanks uh, very, very much, Michelle. I uh, really concur with a lot of the comments that have been made already uh, by Nick and Paul. Uh, I've been doing this surgery uh, same day case since uh, 2008 when we did the first. And uh, it wasn't until the MBS AQIP was gonna exclude us from doing bariatric surgery in the ASC that I decided to publish our data because we had the only data at the time. So I'm gonna share some of those things and uh, we have never used buttress. So I'm gonna give you my experience with non-buttressing and let you decide, of course, you know, what is a value. I can understand why some surgeons don't want to change what they do. And we get into routines of imbricating and not imbricating. And uh, I still imbricate the top three centimeters because, uh, like you said, uh, that's where most of the leaks are. So what can we do? We try to uh, give, us, give ourselves what we call sleeper stitches. Let me uh, share my screen. Can, can everyone see the screen or not? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. You can go into full, full uh, screen mode. Yep. Excellent. So what I've been doing is really, uh, these are my disclosures. This is Seattle and some of you may not know Mount Rainier, but it's, this is what I can see outside uh, my bedroom window. It's really a remarkable place to live. And, uh, this time of year is just fantastic. And for those who are not sure where Washington is, Washington State we're talking about is way, way up in the uh, upper corner of the Pacific Northwest, uh, not too far from uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. What it really comes down to is does uh, buttressing prevent bleeding? And I'm going to show you two videos. And these are the staplers that 
uh, we most commonly use between uh, Medtronic and Ethicon. Uh, this is the Echelon stapler. And you, you can see the staple line. It's beautiful, so hemostatic. I will cauterize uh, little bleeding points uh, along the length of the staple line uh, and uh, never had an issue with leaks related to that. So that's, uh, I'd be interested to have you guys guess which uh, stapler this is, but I'll tell you the cartridges. The cartridge on this one was uh, one blue and four whites. And uh, so this is a uh, Ethicon. So this is the uh, Medtronic stapler, and you can see this is also uh, hemostatic. I had to do a little bit more buzzing on this one. Um, I used uh, four purples and one tan, and I, I do imbricate the upper three centimeters of the state line. I mean, look how hemostatic that is. And we come to uh, the other concern is buttressing prevents leaks or decreases leaks. I don't know if you ever blown up the, the stomach, but the, the remnant is pretty fascinating and uh, patients are quite uh, appalled at how big their stomach can actually be. Uh, this, this patient uh, actually did last week and she had seven uh, firings of the stapler. And uh, here it is again, and it's just impressive, the amount we take out and, and the capability of sending patients home the same day. But I wanna emphasize that the importance of this is that that staple line is not oozing or bleeding when we blow it up. And the other interesting thing is it's airtight. And I got, I got a brief video here to show you. This is one of my partners, uh, Eric it's Harris. It's quite a large volume. Uh, we fill this one up with air so we can demonstrate how and you can see how distensible the stomach is. When it's put under pressure. So uh, is that a specimen of a gastric sleep? So I think that's pretty uh, amazing what we do. And, uh, you know, being able to take that amount of stomach out and send patients home is uh, really in incredible. So I, I had just a, a brief case study, and this is one of the reasons I, I got so, um, I guess, um, the word is just uh, excited, enthusiastic about outpatient uh, bariatric surgery. And it's this low BMI category, which are well suitable for the ASC. And we see patients like this every week, a 42 year old female with a BMI of 32, has several uh, comorbidities, but they're not real severe. And you know, they, wanna, they may weigh close to 200 pounds and they, they're happy at 120. That's the way they were uh, when they, they first got married. Uh, here's a lovely lady uh, as an example. And then after having several children, I mean, she has this disease we call metabolic syndrome, uh, elevated triglyceride, prediabetes, central obesity. I mean, this is just classic of the patients that we see today. And many of these people are professional women who uh, go to the gyms and they uh, eat healthy, but still can't get their weight down. And it's super frustrating. Uh, they blame themselves. So There's a lot of shame in this and they can come to a place like ours and understand that, hey, we're gonna treat this disease uh, that's caused by hyperinsulinemia. Here she is today, I mean, vibrant, and this is 13 years later. It's really, really remarkable. And she weighs uh, 117. So what are the issues around outpatient ASC bariatrics? It's post-operative bleeding. That is the big, big issue. Uh, you certainly, I, I agree with Paul, you need a uh, competent surgeon, but we had five surgeons in our group and they had some new people come in and we trained them, but you know, we worked together very closely. And once we felt they were competent, we uh, uh, basically let them uh, be the primary surgeons and uh, move forward. But there's a host of other issues that I've already mentioned by Paul with about equipment, staffing, insurance reimbursement, accreditation, legal risks. And there's always naysayers out there that says, ah, you shouldn't be doing this, this is dangerous. 
when I started this, this is what's uh, heretical. Uh, it really, people thought I was putting patients' uh, lives in danger and so forth. So I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, our outcomes. But there's there's benefits to having a bespoke bariatric ASC unit, and this is a place, whether it's in the hospital or in a freestanding center, that, that's dedicated with the, the messaging and the patient uh, care pathways and the preoperative counseling, intraoperative care, and especially the, the PACU nurse, knowing, hey, what to do. And it's all a rhythm and everyone knowing exactly what to do. And this all comes, uh, what we, I, I could call uh, air amps. And really the, the goal here is to improve access to care without decreasing the quality. And, and frankly, the quality is improved without a doubt, the quality is improved in the care. And we hear this day after day, patients coming in and said, I've never been cared for like this by a physician's office. But what it gets down to is we're gonna have more people come to our centers because of word of mouth. And Nick said this, most of our patients come to us through uh, word of mouth. But there's, there's other uh, ancillary benefits to all of this that we should be looking at very closely. This is the first paper. I was encouraged to collect the data when the MDSA quit was making the decisions and they weren't gonna allow outpatient bariatric surgery, uh, mainly gastrointestinal stapling and only gastric banding. And at the time, gastric banding was falling out of favor and get, sleeve gastrectomy was becoming more and more popular. So we published our first 250 cases. And uh, I'm not gonna go over the criteria because Paul uh, identified it perfectly. And uh, he does what, similar to what we've been doing for the past uh, 14 years. But this is the outcome. And you, you think about the staplers, and I agree with Nick that the, the staplers are much better. But even back then, in the first 250 cases, we had put one post-op bleed that required transfer, and we didn't reoperate. We gave the patient two units of blood, and the patient went home after a couple of days. Uh, the other is hypoxia. And we became very aggressive about treating sleep apnea or at least identifying it preoperatively because that is a significant risk in the ASC is untreated sleep apnea, especially in the setting of unknown heart disease. So we do screen pretty much, uh, we screen everyone for uh, sleep apnea. A few years after uh, the MBSA quit got going, they, uh, separated patients in the ASC environment into low acuity and high acuity. And we had been doing high acuity for years, so we decided to publish our outcomes uh, on that topic. And what we found is we transferred uh, one patient out of 120. And high acuity is like band to sleeve conversions, high BMI, so it'd be 55 and BMI and above in males, 60 and above in females and uh, elderly, 65 and above. And uh, we ended up reoperating on uh, only one patient, but the emission rate was notably uh, higher. And that's because these people have high, <laughs> higher acuity. No buttressing again in these patients, only one bleed. So this is probably our, our premier paper. And this was done in a freestanding uh, one room ASC, uh, about a block from the hospital, 2,534 cases. And this is over a 10 year period. Uh, we collected all the data and uh, I can tell you, it's seared in your mind, you know, the complications. And the, if you own your, your ASC and there's a complication there, that has huge repercussions throughout the area not just by word of mouth, but by uh, your PCP referrals. And you just can't have mortalities. And I can say that, you know, we had uh, three mortalities early on, but it had nothing to do with the place of service was at. I mean, patient had an MI several days after, and there was a, a leak that ended up with uh, intra-abdominal abscess that uh, patient didn't get uh, the care and uh, untreated sleep apnea. So, but the big issue is bleeding. There's no doubt bleeding was the major cause for transfers. It was 1.22%. Bleeding complications in the total uh, cohort here was 
29 out of 2,534 cases, 1.2%. And frankly, that's higher than what we see today. I think uh, today it's, it's closer to about 0.7%, but no buttressing out of all these cases, even on the redos. So I, I, I think the vessel sealer, I agree with Paul about using a bipolar. I think that's really important. Uh, we, we're going to be uh, presenting at the uh, IBC next uh, month about uh, air ramps. The whole thing about duplicating what we've done here, we've got something unique and it's the evolution of over, you know, I've been in practice 20 years uh, doing these types of cases. So I've got a wealth of experience, but other centers won't. And, but you can duplicate them. And I think the most important one is the surgeon having uh, experience and it, it really is uh, that experience being able to decide, hey, what's safe, what's not safe. We have algorithms and protocols, follow the, the, what was initially published, that, that is real key, but what it comes down to is having the team. The team is the most important thing. The surgeon is the head, the lead, but the team and the facility has to support that team. That comes from the anesthesiologist, to the assist, to the scrub, to uh, the recovery, and the clinic, educating the patient beforehand, setting reasonable expectations, and then the aftercare and the communication that goes on after that. My conclusions, buttressing is unnecessary and costly. There's no doubt it significantly increases the cost. A third of our patients are cash pay. Uh, access to care is gonna be affected by those costs. Uh, bare edge surgery can be performed safely without buttressing uh, in the ASC. We do 60% of our cases the same day. There's no data to support buttressing over non-buttressing for decreasing bleeding in the ambulatory surgery setting, you know, level one data. It'd be great to have it. We don't have it. And it's, the future. Uh, the relatives do that. They don't like to do that. We were right. It's, it's, uh, uh, I some background noises. <laughs> but anyways, uh, with decreasing costs, more people are going to seek bariatric surgery. We've got a huge issue here in um, Seattle with uh, nursing and staffing shortages, and the hospitals aren't allowing us to do cases. So, uh, you know, even yet, yesterday, they wanted to cancel my cases, but because I can do patients the same day safely and the hospital fully supports it, 60% of our cases, whether they're done at the hospital or done in the ASC, they're, they're done as uh, same day. And up to 90% are kept as a 23 hour stay and, and go home. Whatever your feelings are about uh, outpatient bariatric surgery, the market forces will drive the growth of this. You may not like it. You may be a fan of it. Uh, it's really going to be driven by the market. And that's just the way it is. Insurers and cash pay. Hospital administrators may not like it because they're declining reimbursement, but they got to figure new ways of, of revenue. Uh, I'll leave you with this post. Uh, I mean, we are truly doing uh, amazing things treating this metabolic disease. And this uh, lovely lady here is my wife. She was kind of let me share, share her story. Thank you very much. Hey, that, that, that was an awesome presentation, really. I think that we are all convinced that we should do our patient bariatric surgery right now <laughs> with the data you have all presented and, and, and you are supporting no battery things. So I'm wondering if we have any questions from the panel, Michelle? No, I think I, think, um, uh, I saw uh, that um, Peter was using cartridges that a stable height seems to be uh, lower than than uh, what I uh, use. For example, I start with a black, and then I go depending on the company. You know, I go to the next level, either a green or or a purple, depending on the company, uh, and then I finish with uh, orange or uh, I don't know what the color would be with the other company. But um, the problem we had with these meta analysis with buttress is that some surgeons are changing the staple height as they use buttress, for example, because it makes, it's, it, it's quite thick. And, and I don't know if we're looking at the effect of the buttress or if we're looking at the effect of different staple height. And, and I'm un, unable to answer that. And 
Perhaps some people get less bleeding because they go to smaller staple height, but they might get more necrosis and slightly more leaks as a result. I don't know. We don't have any good data on this because when we look at the papers, they often don't tell exactly how many and what staple height we're using and it makes too many variables. So uh, I would leave it to that, that we don't have, you know, the final answer on this. I think this is a really important question, Michelle, because staple height is uh, very important to the integrity of the tissue, bringing it together, not making it ischemic, but not allowing it to bleed. And I, I think we can borrow from things like Intuitive and Medtronic's got, uh, they measure the thickness of the tissue. And uh, many surgeons are switching to the tighter loads. And I don't think we're seeing any more leaks. And I think we're going to see maybe less bleeding. I, I personally think uh, leaks at the top end of the stomach, of course, are a pressure phenomenon. But I also think if you don't have a, a nice tight staple line up there, you see when we squeeze that stomach, you know, no air is leaking through. And that, that to me, to speak volumes about how well these staplers are designed. And where is the bleeding coming from? It's not from the stable line. It's coming from the vessels coming into the stomach when we take it. Yeah. It's so easy to partially dissect one of those, not know it. It's surrounded by fat. And boom, the patient goes to the PACU and the blood pressure goes up. So we raise the blood pressure uh, right after we've done stapling. We'll see some bleeding points, make sure there's no bleeding uh, along where the vessel sealer was at. And uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of bipolar uh, vessel sealers. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that the, I was asked to close the program. It has been wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, yeah. Robin. Thank you, Phil. Santi. And uh, nice seeing you all. I love Seattle, Peter. What you show is amazing. I, I, <laughs> I envy you. The best place in the world in summer. No it question is. about it. You visit us. You visited me in Minnesota at one time. I remember. I remember. Yeah, okay. I remember. All right. Ariel, the floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Santi. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery Reproduction. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress is being streamed live this September 19th through the 21st from a sold out venue. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless.